Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Let's head straight to our second conversation where we have Enes Ereke, who is the coordinator of Yaga Africa. Uh, he's on standby. He joins us in no time. Uh, the Senate has rejected a bill by President Muhammad Buhari seeking the amendment of Section 84, subsection 12 of the Electorate uh, of the Electoral Act. Section 84, subsection 12 presents political or prevents political office holders from contesting for elections from uh, the party primary level without resigning. The bill had scaled the first reading on Tuesday despite court order barring Senate from acting on it. Uh, the request was rejected by Senator Yahya Abdullahi, who led the debate for the second reading of the bill on Wednesday. The senator kicked against it and voted no when it put to voice vote by the president of the Senate, Ahmed Lawan. Uh, we have our guest joining us, Enes Tereke, who is the coordinator of Yaga Africa. It's good to have you join us this morning, Enes. Thank you very much. Good morning. And just to clarify, Coordinator Yaga Africa Center for Legislative Engagement. All right, thanks for that. Uh, so um, let's get your thoughts on this one. Did this come to you as a surprise, looking at the fact that over time, it, you know, the Ninth Assembly has been described as a uh, rubber stamp? Well, not, not exactly. It didn't come as a surprise. I, I wasn't surprised. Because um, uh, if you pick the Electoral Act 2022, you would find that it, before now there, are, there were moves by lawmakers to put some safeguards in the law, safeguards that will ensure that we provide a level playing field for everybody who would want to contest or run for election in the country at any level. Uh, one of those safeguards initially was um, when the lawmakers provided in the law that um, in the bill then that nomination of candidates would only be through the direct primary method. Now that was uh, that was a safeguard they tried to put there because over time governors have been accused of you know hijacking delegates through uh, uh, delegates in the indirect primaries method. Now, eventually, that didn't work out. But there was another safeguard where you try to ensure that you prevent, as you read out in Section 84, sub 12, that political appointees uh, uh, do not contest primaries if they are still holding offices or they do not serve as delegates, you know, to vote in uh, congresses and conventions of political parties. So that's it. The safeguard puts there to ensure one, that there is a level playing field for everybody. Then two, also, as also equally as, uh, as part of ensuring a level playing field, to ensure that uh, the executive, for instance, you know, there, there are two issues in that, in that subsection. One is that if you're a political appointee, you cannot be a voting delegate in a Congress or a convention. Now, you can also not stand as an aspirant in a Congress or a convention. So when you look at the two things, it tries to ensure that in a situation where the executive appoints a, a large number of aides, for instance, those aides will, uh, will not be delegates in the primary in the nomination uh, uh, elections of political parties. Now, that ensures that the executive, that the, that the process is not tilted in, the, in favor of the executive. Because over the years, we have seen a situation where governors, for instance, will appoint a, a, a retinue of aides, and these aides become uh, delegates in, in, in primary elections. And of course, he who pays the piper will ultimately dictate the tune. And so the appointees of the governor, for instance, will definitely vote in line with what the governor wants. So that has been stopped. Now, the second leg of it is that you can also not contest primary elections if you are still holding an appointed position. Now, that also is to ensure that uh, the privileges attached to those offices that could tilt the, 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 the convention or the Congress in your favor are taken away from you so that everybody who participates there has a sense of, has this feeling 
that it has been a, a fair and free process. So in a way, it is to ensure that internally within the runnings of political parties, that the, the field is made level for everybody within, you know, within the party, you know, to have a sense of uh, this sense of justice being done, fairness, this sense of fairness in the nomination process. All right. Uh, Alex Reke, uh, Yaga Africa and yourself um, in, in as far as the, you know, what you do with that um, organization is concerned, I'm sure you have been engaging with uh, uh, legislators and also with Nigerians on this legislative process of amending the Nigerian constitution. Um, are you convinced that these moves by the members of the National Assembly are in the interests of the people and not in their own personal uh, political interest? Well, you cannot take away the enlightened self-interest of these lawmakers. Of course, they are politicians, they have political interests, they have political ambition, uh, and therefore you cannot take away uh, the, the, the fact of their enlightened self-interest. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, recall that they had uh, insisted that uh, nominations would be only through direct uh, method. Now, that was to ensure that where uh, a lawmaker or an individual, for instance, is a popular candidate, that uh, the, the, the situation where governors hijack the political party structures and machineries in the state, especially through the indirect method, that, 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 that situation is prevented. And so while, while others may benefit from it, I, 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 I also feel that there is this idea of this enlightened self-interest to ensure that lawmakers also, as politicians themselves, equally protect themselves. But I, I also believe that there is a larger picture to this, aside from the enlightened self-interest of, uh, of the lawmakers themselves. Yes, they, they, some may see it as a way of trying to protect themselves and their political interests and ambitions. But generally and uh, ultimately, the nation benefits from this because, like we said, uh, there is this idea that it gives to everyone this sense of fairness. But then again, on, on the flip side, you also find out that if you say an office holder cannot contest, an, uh, cannot contest a primary election because there are certain advantages that it confers on him or on her. You also, you also recall that the lawmakers can contest election while still holding offices either in the National Assembly or in the State Houses of Assembly. So in that regard, you may not wish away the, the enlightened self-interest of lawmakers, as you, you rightly pointed out. Um, um, you talked about the lawmakers and, of course, the fact that they can still contest. Um, we look at the power of incumbency, uh, which this is talking about. The, would you agree that the greatest beneficiaries of this uh, power of incumbency when it comes to elections are the elected officials, apart from the appointed officials? So you have those in the legislature and you have those in the executive, the governors and the president. This doesn't affect them. Um, and these are the greatest um, and most... Uh, uh, contested positions, if you want to call it that, legislative positions, the state houses of assembly, the national assembly, mm -hmm. and the executive positions, the governorships, or the governors and the president. And so if, if these people are still also not subject to something like this, um, should we expect any drastic you know, change in, in what we're trying to change? Well, like, like, like we said earlier, yes, there is an enlightened self-interest in this. And so while you are trying to cure uh, one ailment, one one problem. We still see it, we see the we see its ugly head rearing up in another area. For instance, like we mentioned, lawmakers will still hold offices and run for positions as state uh, uh, state governors, the presidents equally. And uh, this is what confers that power of incumbency uh, and the advantages that this positions will confer on them while running for offices. And so um, you, you, you haven't ultimately, you know, uh, cured this problem of conferring undue advantages on political office holders. 
particularly elected uh, political office holders because they will still be in offices, they will still be in their, in their various offices while contesting for another office. But I think ultimately what this, uh, this provision tries to prevent and uh, probably the idea or philosophy behind it is to prevent, uh, like mentioned earlier, this situation where um, the executive appoints a huge or a very large number of aides and then they become delegates in congresses and conventions. And then, of course, we know that when these aides or political office uh, appointees, you know, become delegates in elections, of course, we can, we can, we can determine the outcome of these conventions or congresses even before they are conducted. So I think that is largely what the lawmakers tried to cure there to prevent uh, the, 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 the nomination processes from, if you like, from being tilted uh, in the advantage of the executive. But if, if it is about power of incumbency, the power of incumbency still remains and the undue advantages it, it confers on political office holders, elected political office holders, will still be there with us for a very long time. We will see them making use of uh, state, uh, state uh, apparatus, uh, the, the police, including resources of, of, of the states to run elections. So we will still have this challenge with us, even with uh, 84 sub 12 of, of the Electoral Act 2022. So, so, so moving forward now, because we, we cannot take out the fact that the power of incumbency constantly plays in our election. And in 2023, I mean, we can really not take that out. You see in a state where uh, you have a governor and a governor defects from a particular political party, and then you have all of the political appointees defecting. And then you begin to ask yourself, what is really going on here? But that's the power of incumbency. So do we need to look at having um, new legislation or what do we need to do to begin to cop the excesses because at the end of the day it is entirely not a fair play for democracy yes i agree with you it is not a fair play for for democracy that somebody is in office and continues to use uh, the, the advantages of that office you know to in, in running for office against others now that already confers some advantages, some privileges, you know, uh, on that particular political office holder. But then uh, I think it is not really about legislation this time around because there are certain things you cannot legislate. I mean, uh, uh, we say that we do not want to over legislate, for instance, on on some of these issues. Now, what I believe we need to do is to begin to, 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 to strengthen some of these institutions of the state. If we strengthen the institutions of the state so that they realize that, uh, for instance, if, if, if the security forces and agencies realize that they exist for the benefits of Nigerians and Nigeria, and not to a particular regime or to a particular individual, then we may begin to cure some of these challenges. For instance, you recall that uh, uh, even as president of the United States of America, Donald Trump kept complaining that state institutions were witch hunting him. And yet he was the president of, of, of the United States of America, but he complained severally, he cried out severally that the, uh, the, the apparatus of the state were various institutions of the state were witch hunting him. Now, that is a situation you cannot have in Nigeria because, for instance, during elections, you will find out that the police, for instance, will begin to act as if it is the militant wing of the party in power. Now, um, that shouldn't be the case. Now, so what we need is really uh, not about legislation any longer because I think the laws of the land are clear. What we need is to begin to find a way of strengthening these institutions and then winning them away from, uh, you know, uh, from this attachment to regimes and individuals. And so if, if, we, if we ensure that these institutions are independent, if we ensure that they, they, they see themselves as institutions of the states and not as institutions of individuals or political parties, then we can, we can conduct elections without fearing that the security agencies, for instance, will act in a way that will confer advantages on any individual or any 
uh, political party in power. Now, okay. that is the way I think we, 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 we should go in, in order to ensure that we level the field for everybody who wants to contest the election in the and, country. Okay, very quickly, because we're out of time, we have the uh, Electoral Act as amended, we have the INEC guidelines, but we also have the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is clear on the requirements for contesting public office at various levels. You look at Section 65, Section 106, Section 131, Section 177, and so on and so forth, uh, Section 182. Um, isn't there a possibility that any Nigerian can challenge this INEC, um, this Electoral Act Amendment in court and say, see, you can't deny me of my rights to contest the election as a, a citizen of Nigeria who qualifies simply because I hold a political office. Because the Constitution says I have a right. And anything that goes against the Constitution is null and void. So very quickly, in a sentence or two, because we have to type, what, what do you say to this? Yes, I, I, I agree with you, and I, I, I'm looking forward to the, to the litigations that will come up as far as uh, uh, Section 84, Sub 12 of the Electoral Act 2022 is concerned. Because some persons, just as you have said, and uh, it, it was on this basis that the President asked the National Assembly you know, to amend that particular provision, that it, it's, it, it's at variance with constitutional provision, which requires a minimum of uh, I think about 30 or 35 days for a political appointee to resign his, his or her position before he or she can run for a particular office. Okay. So uh, it will be interesting to find out what the judiciary will do with that uh, particular we, we, we have to go. section of the, of we the have electoral to go. We have to go. Thank you very much, Enes Reke um, of Yaga Africa. We appreciate your time. And that's so much you can take uh, on the breakfast this morning on Plus TV Africa. Um, Messi, it's been quite an interesting one so far. And of course, we'll return tomorrow on this program same time. And it's okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for being part Thank of the show. And well, that's it. If you missed out on any part of the conversation, it's all right to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. I am Messi Bofford. See you tomorrow. And I'm Kofi Mattel. See you tomorrow. Good morning. <laughs>